All right. Sorry for a little bit of a delay. I had a meeting right before class. Let me shut this. You forgive me? Well, thank you. All right. So attendance grades are up to date. All the homework's graded. Uh, exam one, like I said, um, so <laughs> what happened to me was my original plan was to have our exam the previous week and then my other exam last week, but the weather forced me to have them all in the same week. So I got about <laughs> 80 exams on my desk right now, but you all are first because you had your exam first. So my goal is to have that graded by Wednesday. Um, I've already got about half of it graded. Um, and by and large, I think the class as a whole did fine. Um, it's never the big picture with steel design. It's always the little things, I, I think. Now, I know that number two was challenging, but it wasn't worth much. So it was meant to be a challenge, but it wasn't meant to make or break things. So again, don't worry. I think you're going to do just fine. I want to talk about logistics moving forward because we lost a little bit with the weather and our schedule changed a little bit. And I like making things simple. I don't know about you, but I do. Um, here's our schedule for the next few weeks. So um, this week, we are going to talk about bolts. We're going to talk about bolted connection analysis today, bolted connection design, and slip critical connections. That's going to be our week. Next week. We are going to talk about welds. I'm going to introduce the topic. And just like with last time, remember how I introduced bolted connections and then I didn't give you a homework? Well, I'm going to do the same thing with welds. I'm going to have a lecture where I give you an introduction on welded connections, and I'm not going to give you a homework due the next day. There's only going to be two homeworks on welds. Welds are pretty easy. So we're going to have a welded connection analysis lecture, welded connection design lecture. There's going to be two homeworks assigned to that. Monday, March the 7th, we're going to have our second exam review. Wednesday, March 9th, we are going to celebrate. And on Friday, assuming we don't have any crazy weather, I'm going to cancel class. And then, <laughs> what? What was, the, what was the sound effect? Either excitement or Well, it's listed in the schedule as um, a makeup day. So if we don't need it, we won't do it. And when we come back, see, here's, here's what I don't want to do. I do not want to talk about columns and beams until after spring break because I don't want to talk about it for a day and then you all go and drink margaritas and Mai Tais and come back to what were we talking about? I'd like to focus our column and beam discussion after break. Any questions? Everybody good? Let's talk about bolt shear bolt bearing. Okay, so um, today is meant to discuss some concepts and make sure that you are understanding what's going on with bolted connections. Our homework assignment is going to maybe feel a little repetitive, but it is addressing a particular riddle in the world of steel design, and that is how to address splices, because splices are very common. They are also something you need to put a little bit of initial thought in in terms of how to uh, uh, assess them and determine their capacity, et cetera. But let's recall, so you all have had a homework assignment on this that was due today. Did anybody have any questions about that? Hopefully that was pretty straightforward. Yes, sir. Hold on. Did I tell you? No. Hold on. Well, well, now wait. What happens when I don't tell you whether or not they're included or excluded? You assume they're included. It's like I wanted y'all to be engineers or something. That's crazy, isn't it? No, it, in all seriousness, whenever you don't know, and it's very common in situations that you don't know, you assume they're included. You can detail them such that they are excluded, but a lot of times in design scenarios, you don't know. So that's not that uncommon. Because it, it's dependent upon plate thicknesses. And in design land, Things change. So, any, any other questions? All right. So we know how to determine the available shear strength of a given bolt, um, according to Table 7.1 on page 7-22. We know how to do bolt bearing capacity. It's a bit long, um, but it's doable. Okay. 
So, so yeah, okay. Layout requirements, we know our minimum and maximum versus our preferred. Again, on homework assignments, if you are in design land, I will tell you whether or not you are using minimum bolt spacing or preferred bolt spacing. But if you're in assessment land, if you're analyzing a connection to determine whether or not it adheres to prescribed limits, you're determining whether or not it's between minimum and maximum. So that should be pretty straightforward. Um, bolt spacing limitations are, are computable. Edge distance requirements, the maximum's computable. The minimum you have to look up. Because again, that comes from the fabricators. That's their required, that's their uh, preferences to ensure that the connection uh, that is um, fabricated at the end of the day has uh, sufficient quality assurance and quality control. I want to look at a real world example to kind of get y'all thinking about this. Y'all know where this is? The old engineering building. The one that was uh, constructed in like 2007. I know that's old, right? We call it the old engineering building. It's really not that old, you know. My office was actually in here my first year here. We had cubicles in there. That's where they have all the 3D printers and whatnot. Before there were 3D printers, there were cubicles in there. So I had an office in there. That was only for my first year. And then we all got an email that said, the new building's open starting at 8 a.m. on Monday, May, whatever. You can move in. And by 8.05, all my stuff was already over there and unpacked. So, Because I was ready to get out of there. Okay. What I want to talk about is a real bolted connection. And specifically, I want to look at these right here. Okay. So what's going on up here, and I will do my best to try and draw this, is we have a column, and we have this little extended sort of tab right here that's welded to the column. Do you all kind of see that right here? Right? And then we have an I-beam. Now I'm sort of drawing this from the back, if you will. Um, so the I-beam sort of frames in like that. We have the flange just coming through about like that. There's that. There's that. We've got one, two, three, four bolts. With me so far? So how would we assess this? How would we as structural engineers assess this problem? Okay. Let's, let's walk through this like we're engineers or something. So we have this beam right here. So I'm curious. Let's see if you all are remembering some discussions from structural analysis last semester. Given this connection, would I treat this beam as simply supported or would I treat it as having fixed supports? All right. Who says fixed? Who says simple? The ones that say fix, take your hand up, do that. No. Why no fixed supports? A simple support transmits shear. A fixed support transmits shear and moment, right? And in I-beam construction, a fixed support indicates that we are connecting not just the web, but the flanges as well. We tend to treat the flanges as the component that's transmitting moment and the web that's transmitting shear. Even though there's four bolts, I'm sure some of you are thinking there's no way that that could rotate. Well, I, I get what you're saying, but keep in mind in structural analysis, rotations are small. The idea is that this connection does not have the rotational stiffness necessary to appreciably resist moments and resulting rotations. So we would treat that as a simply supported beam, right? Does that, does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? So. We have this simply supported beam. So how do we do the analysis of a simply supported beam in a frame? Well, we look up above. We see we got a roof. We got some beam elements framing into that, these open web joists. We've got live loads on the roof, dead loads. We got potentially snow loads here in Huntington, West Virginia. We do some load factoring. We do some tributary area. Boom, we have a simply supported beam with a uniformly distributed load, right? With me so far? We take that simply supported beam with a uniformly distributed load, and we get Support reactions, right? WL over 2, y'all remember all that, right? And then that WL over 2, that's basically going to come in as a vertical load right there, right? So let's say that vertical load is, I don't know, a factored load of 30 kips, right? And so what I then might do is I might say, okay, this is a bolted connection. 
I got four A3 25 three quarter inch diameter bolts. So if I got 30 kips on that, that's maybe seven and a half kips per bolt. Is that enough to adequately resist the shear uh, experience per bolt? Maybe what I'll do is I'll go to table 7-1, look up uh, A3 25 three quarter inch diameter bolts and single shear. I don't know, are those threads included or excluded? Well, there's two ways of figuring that out. I could get on a, a crane and actually look at it, or I could assume the threads are included, right? And I could look at the uh, shear capacity per bolt and see if it has adequate capacity. With me so far? I, I, I want to stop, stop for a second, all seriousness. Is it, everybody with me with what I'm doing? Any questions? That's a great question. Um, now, it could be in the real world. Here there isn't, right? Because let me, um, hold on. Give me a second. So, uh, come on. Are you kidding me? I'm hitting copy. Copy. Paste. So, I don't know if you can see that, but if you look right here, there's only one, so here's the I-beam, and there's only one plate. If there were two plates, you'd see a plate running back here and then a plate on front of it, right? So does everybody see how these are in single shear with me so far? Now here's the thing, okay? Now I also want to talk a little bit about bolt bearing, right? Because whenever you're looking at a bolted connection, there's the failure of the bolt. That's the bolt shear limit state. That's what you look up in table 7-1. You determine the uh, shear capacity of a single bolt multiplied by the number of bolts. But there's also the case of bolt bearing, okay? Now, in the case of bolt bearing, there are two plates, right? And that is always the case in terms of bolted connections because you always have, I mean, what is a connection? You take a piece of steel, you take another piece of steel, and you connect them, right? So there's always two elements, right, on either end of the, on either side. So... I propose that there is not only a bolt shear limit state where we're looking at these bolts, but there's bolt bearing, okay? And let me ask you this. Do you think the web thickness of this I-beam is the exact same thickness as this steel, plate of steel? Maybe they have different yield strengths as well, right? I mean, what is the bolt bearing limit state a function of? Well, it's a function of the bolt spacing. That's the same on both of them, right? The edge distance... Now, the edge distance for the plate is easy to determine, but what about for the I-beam? I mean, what, are we using that as the edge distance? Probably not, because it'd have to rip through the entirety of the flange. So probably for one of these bolts, I would just assume 2.4 dBTFU. The other three, I would take the minimum of 2.4 dBTFU or 1.2 LCTFU. Does that make sense? Okay. But they probably have different thicknesses. They also probably have different FU values, right? So what I would have to do is do the bolt bearing capacity of the I-beam or the W section and then another check of the bolt bearing capacity of the plate. See whether or not it's, uh, uh, which one has the lower capacity because that's the one that's going to govern. With me so far? There's also a completely another limit state that we're going to have to check. We're not going to be able to do that now. We'll have to do that later. But how do you think that plate is being connected to this round column? A well, right? So what we might also do is determine the number of, or the capacity per inch of weld. And what I would probably do is take that and multiply it by however long this is, probably times two, because there's a weld on the front and a weld on the back, and see if that is bigger or smaller than 30 kips with me so far maybe also check a gross section yielding net section fracture block shear on this plate maybe this plate maybe that chunk rips out in block shear right with me so far is this all making i want you to kind of wrap your head around this in the real world and see if this makes sense any questions 
Other than the analysis, all it takes is the dimensions and a little bit of calcs. Okay. Hold on. Did I turn this on? I did turn it on, but it doesn't like me. Let's consider the riddle of a spliced connection. Okay. Where did my little pen go? Oh, there's my little pen. Okay. Now, a spliced connection is very common in the world of structural engineering. You see them all the time in bridges. Okay. How many of you have been paying attention to some of the bridge constructions going on there? Here's one. I don't know if anybody lives near the Charleston area. You seen that that one they've been erecting near exit 44 for St. Albans? Anybody seen that? Right? That is not one steel beam that goes from beginning to end. It is a series of steel beams that have been spliced together. That's what those big old bolted connections are to connect those pieces. And there are reasons for that. That bridge, and and I don't know the dimensions because I don't I mean I have the plans on me, but it looks like it's got a little first off, those beams are really big. Looks like it's got a little bit of curve to it. So maybe what happens is we have to erect the element in pieces, or we have to uh, fabricate the element in pieces because we have to ship it in pieces. We can't actually fit the entire element on one truck, right? So we put it in, so we uh, ship it in pieces, and then we splice it together on site and lift it accordingly, right? So it's not that uncommon in the world of structural engineering to have spliced elements for large load carrying uh, components. Now, I want to consider this splice connection. This is just member's intention, okay? This is just a member intention, so there's no bending moment or anything like that. Um, let me ask you a question. Let's look at this from a bolt shear perspective. Are these bolts in single shear or double shear? Double shear. That's 100% right. Now, here's the kicker, okay? If I were yanking on this in tension, how do you determine the capacity according to the bolt shear limit state? You take the capacity of a single bolt and you multiply by the number of bolts, right? How many bolts would you consider effective for this connection to determine the capacity according to bolt shear? In other words, is it 40 bolts or is it 20 bolts? It's 20, right? Because half of the bolts are working to transmit load this way, and the other half are working to transmit load this way. How about, how about thinking of it like this? If I yank on this, and these 20 bolts right here fail in shear, can it still resist load? No. It's done for, right? I've completely separated the member. So imagine grabbing this and grabbing this and yanking on it and asking yourself, how many bolts do I have to shear through to completely separate this? It's not 40. It's 20. Does that make sense? Does it, does anybody, I want to make sure that, that everybody sees that. This is very important. Any questions? Okay. Now, let's make some conclusions about bolt shear and some conclusions about bolt bearing. Number one, what did we say the bolts were in single shear or double shear? So we're going to use 20 bolts for this example. <clears throat> for bolt bearing, the same is also true. We don't need to consider the entirety of the connection, but only half of it, if you will. So in order to explain what we're going to do with bolt bearing for spliced connections, what I'm going to do is I'm going to break out again my secret weapon of structural engineering, which is the samurai sword or the lightsaber, if you happen to be a sci-fi fan. 
And I'm going to slash right through the middle of this. Make sense? Okay. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look towards one side. It doesn't matter which. I can look to the right or look to the left. I'm going to look to the right. And I'm going to use some color to try and explain what I got going on here. I have this and this. And I have this. And in terms of bolts, I've got one, two, three, four, five. So I propose that whenever we deal with bolt bearing, we're always going to have two cases of bolt bearing. In other words, we're going to have the case that transmits load this way, and we're going to have the case that transmits load this way. So if we want to maybe do it like this, we'll call it case one and case two. So case one is going to be what I'll call the main plate, and case two is what I'm going to call the splice plate. So the reason for the different cases is because let's consider the blue plate. This is the main plate, okay? The blue plate is going to have a thickness, right? We'll call this thickness of the main plate, right? So in this case, T is whatever that thickness is. But it's also going to have an FU. Right? It's also going to have an S. It's going to have an LE. Those parameters are going to affect what the capacity is. Right? For the splice plate, we're going to have a different thickness. So the way that I like to do this is I like to say whatever this is and whatever this is, that the thickness is that, right? Because that's the total amount of steel transmitting load that way. Very rarely in steel design would those be of different material grades. It actually is possible that they have different thicknesses, okay? Um, especially in beam splices where you have different uh, uh, material thicknesses on either end. Um, but the material grade is probably the same but it is possible that this material has a different uh, FU than this one. This could be A992 steel, this could be A36 steel, and they have different FU values. Now the one thing that is going to be the same, I can tell you right off the bat, is the S. They're going to be the same, right? Because if the bolts are spaced three inches on the main plate, they're spaced three inches on the splice plate. That's, that's common sense, right? But the LE, the LE could be different as well. Oh. So the point is, you might have a bolt bearing case for the main plate, and you might get a capacity and a completely different bolt bearing limit state for the splice plate. And it's possible that one governs versus another. That maybe this one gives 500 kips, but this one gives 400 kips. And sometimes you won't know unless you check it. Maybe this plate is thicker than this one, right? But this one has a higher material grade than the other one. So which one gives you the lowest capacity? I don't know. Check them both, right? Fortunately, it is a very plug and chug process, as you learned on the last homework, but you might need to do both, okay? Does that make sense? Now, for the example we're going to do in class today, I'm going to show you how we can reason ourselves out of doing both. But I want you to, by default, think that you need to do both. 
And if you're still unsure with what I'm talking about, don't worry. That's going to become clear right quick. Any questions? All right. Let's look at this example. So I've got a half inch thick member spliced with two quarter inch thick plates. We got seven eighths inch diameter A325 bolts and all the steel is grade A36. We're going to determine the design strength according to bolt shear and bolt bearing. What we're also going to do later is determine whether or not uh, the connection meets layout requirements. Okay. Okay. All right. I'm going to give everybody a sec to copy this down, then we'll get to it. All right, everybody good? I see you shaking your head. Don't worry, by the way, these slides are on Blackboard. But, and another thing, I uploaded all the slides through spring break. The welded slides aren't visible yet. They'll become visible um, right before we discuss welds. Um, and the exam review slides will be visible right before the exam. So, But all this is on Blackboard. With me so far? Let's get into it. Let's start with bolt shear. All right, which group of bolts do we have? And included or excluded? Because you don't know. Single or double shear? All right. And how many bolts do we have? Hold on. This is a splice. We don't have eight bolts. We have four. Because all, because again, if you were yanking on this, all it would take would be for these bolts over here to snap and you would be separating the member, right? All it takes is those four bolts to fail and shear. Uh, yes? Is that two and one quarter or just the inch? Where, uh, Where it's right here, yeah. two and three quarters. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Right. Now, Based on this data, what is the shear capacity of a single bolt, according to Table 7-1, PRN, for a 7 8 inch A3, uh, A325 threads included double shear? Say it again. 48.7. Do I have a second on that? And that's kips per bolt right? And so if there are four bolts, what is phi R in? 194.8. Do I have a second?
I'm going to stop for a second and see if this makes sense. Hopefully this is simple. If you found the value, if you know what I'm doing, why I use that value, why it's double shear, why threads are included. Everybody good? Okay. Okay. Now let's talk about bolt bearing. Let's start off with the stuff that's simple. If I tell you we are dealing with a 7 8 inch diameter bolt, what can you tell what does that tell you about the dimensions of the hole? We add a 16th. Remember we are dealing with the physical dimensions of the hole. Okay. Now, as I said before, the capacity, so here's, here's our expression, right? We take Rn is the minimum we take the minimum of those, right? 1.2 LCTFU, 2.4 DBTFU, and LC there's sort of two LCs. And so these are our official starting equations. Now, we have two cases to consider, right? We have the main plate and we have the splice plate, all right? So imagine I'm samurai sorting or lightsabering right through here, okay? So let's consider the main plate. Hold on. Let's write it the way we would write it on a drawing. And the splice plates. Now help me out. What is the thickness of the main plate? Say, no, what's that? Half inch. What is the thickness of all the splice plates together? One half, because there's two. Quarter inch thick plates. Now, I want everybody to listen up here, okay? Let's assume all things being equal, the material grades, all the other dimensions. Let's just focus on thickness. Let's say the splice plates were a half inch, and let's say this was not a half. Let's say the main plate was three quarters of an inch. What does that mean for a calculation? You don't have to do the main plate. You don't have to do the main plate. Now, expand on that. Why? Uh, it's going to add more bearing capacity for the entire Exactly. It's go you know it's going to yield a larger capacity, right? And so if you're yanking on this, you know the splice plates are going to fail before this one does, right? So there's no point wasting your time checking that because you know this is going to govern, right? Does that make sense? That's if all things were equal, right? Now imagine this material strength was higher than this one. Now it's not so clear, right? Now you got to do both, right? Does that make sense? That, that's sort of the point I'm talking about. Now, what about FU? This is all grade A36 steel. What is FU? What's that? 58. By the way, um, there was a lot of you that said on the exam that the yield strength of A36 was 32 KSI. If you look at the, um, the table, table 2-5, that is only true if the thickness is 8 inches or greater. So 
and every other instance for grade 36, the yield strength is 36 KSI. And I think the only place that we use 8 inch thick plate is NORAD. So that was a joke. Um, okay. Now the bolt spacing, what's the bolt spacing value going to be for these? What's the S value? Two and three quarters. It's not five because five is the spacing this way, but we're yanking on it like this. So S is two and three quarters. Now what about the edge distance? Is that the case for both of them? Yes. How many edge bolts for both of them and how many anterior bolts for both of them? Two and two. So mathematically, is there any difference between the main plate, the main plate, the splice plate? No, right? They only become different cases, and it is very possible that they do, but they only become different cases when these parameters become different between the two, right? And that happens, especially when you have W shapes spliced with plates. Plates come in like half inch thick, and then the thickness of a flange is 0 0.62 whatever inches thick, right? So that's very common, all right? So because of this, we're only going to have to consider one of these, right? So it doesn't really matter which one, So, but by observation, both of them are going to yield the same answer. So Both cases will yield the same capacity. Okay. So this becomes the exact same method that we've used before. I'm actually going to kind of do that somewhat quickly. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to compute LCE, which is LE minus DH over 2. So And I'm going to walk you through these. So there's that. And... What are we getting for this? I believe it's... Can somebody check this? I think I might have an error on mine. You think this one's wrong? I think you're right. Hold on. I think you're right. I got, I got some errors here. Hold on. I might need your help on this. Because this doesn't look right. Per day. Say it again. 1.810? 1. 1. Yeah, I think that looks more right. Any se and seconds on this? Okay, all right. So sort of this part is what we do first. And then our next part And then this one.
And so we sort of do those next. So we do like this set of calculations and then we do these. So let's see. I broke out, I brought my calculator, so let's see what we can do. I'm getting 35.89 for this first one. Is that right? I'm help somebody help me out. Yeah. For the next one, I'm getting 63.08. Is that right? And this one I'm getting 60.9. Right? So from this, I can determine that RNE is the minimum of this and this, which is 38 or 35.89 kips per bolt. And RNI is the minimum of this and this, which is 60.9. So two times this plus two times this And what does that come out to be? I'm getting 193.58. Is that right? Or that's what you got? Anybody have? Uh, okay. All right. And so what's phi RN? What's, we got to do that. What's phi again? And so I'm getting that phi RN is 145.2. Is that correct? So now look what happened. Which one governed the connection? Bolt bearing. So now if I yank on this connection, it's going to fail in bolt bearing before it fails in bolt shear, right? Okay. I mean, think about what's going on. We've got these humongous bolts in double shear, right? And we've got really thin plates with not a lot of space between them. It kind of makes sense that the plates are going to be a little we weaker than maybe they were in some of our previous examples, right? But you don't know unless you just do it. You have to go through the math and check it. All right. Now, we are running a little bit out of time, so in the interest of uh, time, I am going to call it a little bit and say that phi RN is 145.2 kips. That's how much the, capac or the connection can hold before it will fail. Um, but we are not going to have time to check the connection layout requirements, but I think that's really simple. Just check S min and S max and see if the S falls in between. Check the LE min, LE max, see if the connection falls in between. What we are going to talk about next time, which I think is really important, uh, is not just the procedure for connection design, 
because we are going to have a step-by-step -step procedure. But next time, what we're also going to talk about is some real-world aspects of connection design. Like, for example, it is very common to lay out connections on a three-inch grid. That's very common because it meets spacing and edge distance requirements a lot of the time. Uh, but what happens when your connection fails? What do you do? And it's not always add more bolts. And there's no one answer. you got to be an engineer about it and think about what's the right decision for the problem at hand. And so I want to give you a few tools at your disposal to make your life a little easier. That's all I got. Until Wednesday. <laughs>